Um, good evening, dear friends. Um, uh, the, we are back with the, the series of uh, Rondelli webinars. Uh, we are facing some uh, technical problems uh, with the connection with our distinguished uh, speaker and the friend uh, uh, Linus Linkavichus. We hope uh, he will join us uh, in the course of this uh, uh, webinar uh, with uh, our good friend and our colleague uh, uh, Grigol Galublishvili. Uh, Gega is a former uh, Prime Minister of Georgia, former uh, Georgia's permanent representative to NATO and uh, distinguished Georgian diplomat with uh, the career diplomat with uh, uh, long time service and now the associate professor at the NATO defense uh, uh, national defense college uh, of uh, united arab emirates um uh, good evening uh, good, uh, giga it's a great pleasure always to have you with us uh, and uh, of course, uh, the world is discussing, uh, uh, besides the, the World uh, Football Championship, of course, the world is discussing and looking very closely, following very closely the developments in Ukraine. The full-scale uh, Russia's invasion uh, in uh, Ukraine continues uh, for 10 months. And uh, uh, the, for, those, for those who were expecting uh, the, to, to end the war in three days uh, with Poland, uh, Kiev, and the change of regime uh, in Ukraine, uh, there was a big failure, big surprise, unpleasant surprise, and Ukrainian people, uh, brave people of Ukraine, are fighting. Uh, they have uh, certain uh, achievements, they have the good uh, counter-offensive uh, operations, but uh, the the fight is uh, going right now in Bakhmut, in Donetsk region, in uh, in other across the whole front uh, front line. Uh, there is a very heavy fight, especially in Donetsk region, because um, it seems like uh, Putin wants wants the result uh, the, from Donetsk to to report to the people. Uh, to his people, to his supporters, that uh, he has achieved his mission, that uh, freeing uh, and uh, freeing uh, Donetsk and Luhansk uh, population. Uh, but uh, uh, they have uh, uh, annexed. Uh, they have annexed illegally the, the other uh, regions of uh, of Ukraine, uh, and um, they have made this. Uh, uh, Fatal mistake in their decision on uh, uh, annexing the regions of uh, Kherson, uh, region of uh, Luhansk, uh, Donetsk, and Zaporozhye. And of course, uh, the war uh, definitely uh, would not end uh, even with the with the uh, uh, seizure of uh, Bakhmut. And um, um, uh, there, there are no signs, despite the heavy fights in Bakhmut, there are no signs that uh, Ukrainian forces are going to, to give up uh, fighting for Bakhmut. But uh, of course, uh, the, the world, this, uh, uh, the, the societies, the, the people in the, the democratic countries, and not only democratic countries, are asking uh, when uh, and how is going to to end um, this war? Uh, for, for the second part of this question, I have my answer. I'm sure you agree with me that it, it will end uh, with the uh, full victory of of Ukraine over over Russia. But uh, uh, and they will uh, force them out from their territories. But uh, uh, the scenarios are uh, discussed. The scenarios are considered if. Ukraine wins, if Russia wins, or if there is a uh, kind of a, a, a truce agreement, uh, which is uh, hard, heavily criticized. I would like to hear from you about the, uh, these uh, offers from some leaders um, uh, to, to sit down around the negotiations table. So uh, 
the, 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 the headline of this webinar is the, the when and how, but uh, I, I, I would end the war in, uh, in Ukraine, but uh, I would like to, uh, to ask you to el elaborate more about, about the post-war uh, uh, de development scenarios uh, and uh, how it uh, will affect the global um, security architecture and how it's going to affect uh, uh, Georgia's uh, situation, Georgia's role in this uh, global security architecture. So the floor uh, is yours. Alex, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting. I know it's, it's first of all, for you, it sounds weird us talking in English, but yes. we need to respect our audience as well. Of so, course. Uh, uh, it's unfortunate that our old friend Linus is experiencing some technical issues of joining this webinar. Uh, Linus has been uh, instrumental in uh, supporting not only Georgia and Ukraine, but also the idea of the Europol free end and peace. So I uh, hope he can uh, join or we can come together uh, in coming weeks or uh, months uh, one more time. So now coming back to your question, let me set a stage. Uh, one thing is obvious that uh, especially based on what's happening in Bakhmut right now, this fierce fighting, uh, this, uh, I would argue, this uh, mindless uh, uh, Russian uh, continuous attack uh, on one direction uh, that uh, doesn't take into account the losses or the uh, any type of a military logic indicates one thing that the things will uh, get worse before it gets better. But uh, uh, it doesn't matter uh, how this uh, how long this conflict will uh, last, I would argue, and I'll, I'll look from three different perspectives. I would have from, from Russian, from Ukrainian, and from the Georgian perspective. I would argue that irrespective of how long this conflict lasts, uh, Russia will emerge significantly diminished as a result of this conflict, politically, militarily, and economically. Uh, militarily, again, uh, Russia has suffered uh, losses that it has uh, it hasn't suffered for decades. I mean, it's a huge losses that uh, recent history doesn't remember. This type of losses uh, from the Russian side. Its military capabilities have been degraded, significantly degraded. Uh, and I mean, there was just a recent news that the Russia was asking even uh, North Korea to resupply the uniform. So that indicates. Uh, level of degradation of the uh, military capabilities. Uh, but more importantly, uh, when we look to the military aspect, the miss of the Russian strengths of the military strengths of Russia has significantly shattered that this is a second strongest military around the globe. I think that this conflict revealed the all vulnerabilities, all weaknesses of the Russian uh, military, the co corrupt nature and so forth and so forth. Economically uh, speaking, it's uh, uh, it's hard to imagine that Russia will recover uh, those sanctions that has been imposed on Russia and the heavy cost of this military conflict. If we look to the projections, OECD projections this year, the Russian economy will contract by 3.9, almost 4%, and next year uh, uh, by 5.6%. Uh, uh, thousands of the companies uh, fled and left uh, Russian uh, market. Russia is the most sanctioned uh, country around the globe and uh, economic prospects uh, of uh, recovering or even continuing the military activities, I would argue, and supporting the military campaign is bleak. Uh, politically, again, uh, Russia has never been as isolated uh, as it is uh, today. Uh, even if we look and I mean, obvious, there are some obvious uh, indicators. We discussed it before, uh, like uh, Russia always wanted to uh, solve the disagreement uh, among the Western allies. Uh, it got an opposite uh, effect. Uh, so the West and NATO has never been as united as they are today. Russia wanted to uh, stall the uh, Euro-Atlantic integration and Finland and Sweden are joining alliance. Ukraine got a candidate status. So uh, Russia wanted to establish itself as a regional leader. And uh, if we look how uh, Russian leaders and President Putin has been treated, even by uh, some of the CIS leaders in different 
fora and in different uh, meetings, it's obvious that the previous glory and respect is not there. So it's it's been uh, very, uh, very obvious that Russia has become politically uh, isolated. So again, when we look to Russian angle, doesn't matter how long this conflict uh, lasts, I would argue that there are the strong indications that Russia will emerge significantly diminished as a result of this conflict. Now, when we look on the opposite side, on Ukraine, uh, I would argue that despite the immense costs and uh, immense human uh, suffering, uh, Ukraine uh, will emerge as stronger uh, actor from this uh, from this conflict as a strong European nation uh, with a very uh, uh, <clears throat> with a very uh, uh, significant prospect of joining Euro-Atlantic uh, family. So uh, first of all, militarily, I think that it's very important that Ukrainians gain the significant self-confidence by uh, beating Russians on the battlefield in numerous occasions, whether it was in the beginning of the conflict around Kiev or later in Kharkiv or at a, a more uh, later stage in Kherson. And now they are opposing the Russian uh, aggression uh, around the Bakhmut area. So militarily, uh, Ukraine has gained significant self-confidence, but it also showed to the rest of the world uh, the strengths of the uh, Ukrainian spirit, Ukrainian morale, and uh, Ukrainian fighting uh, capabilities. More importantly, if we look to the dynamics, Alex, we see that the, once the uh, Russian military uh, machinery gets degraded, the Ukrainian uh, military uh, machinery gets resupplied all the time. We can always uh, debate and argue whether we are happy or sometimes we want to see a uh, higher pace of the uh, assistance to Ukraine, but it's undoubted. It's und I mean, it's without any questions that Ukraine has received uh, unprecedented uh, support, both from United States and from European uh, allies, and obviously from uh, NATO in this respect. Uh, politically, Euro Ukraine will emerge as a stronger actor as well. Domestically, Ukraine has never been as consolidated as it is today. Uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, govern government uh, has shown uh, amazing resilience uh, against this uh, shock of uh, of invasion and aggression. And despite this uh, ongoing uh, conflict. If we look to all kind of uh, indicators, reports that are coming from European Union, we see how successful uh, uh, Ukrainians are in implementing reform agenda as well in order to uh, advance its uh, European uh, integration uh, paths. But more importantly, uh, <clears throat> Ukraine is also emerging. And you remember, Alex, you, you have a long experience working in NATO. That's the only criteria, the most important criteria of becoming the NATO member. Uh, is uh, uh, to be able and willing to uh, contribute to the Euro-Atlantic security. And I think that U Ukraine has emerged as one of the most significant contributors to Euro-Atlantic uh, security by opposing the barbaric actions uh, of the Russian aggression. Because this aggression, and we shouldn't deceive ourselves, this aggression is not only against Ukraine, but it's uh, against the idea of the free world, against the idea of a, a democratic uh, uh, and rules-based order. And Ukraine is on a front line uh, defending those values and defending the rules-based international order as well. So I think that uh, Ukraine's contribution into Euro-Atlantic uh, security is unprecedented. And at the end of the day, it will bear its uh, fruits as well. Now, uh, <clears throat> In this light, when you mentioned where does Georgia stand, and this is probably uh, for those of us who uh, who worked in uh, different times on different issues, especially on Euro-Atlantic integration, on European integration, uh, this is a very uh, depressing uh, times to see where where does Georgia stand. Uh, I think that what 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 is happening right now is a historical shift that has never happened in our uh, 30 plus uh, history since the beginning of uh, 90s. Now, 
we always had in our history, we always had some pro-Russian voices, some pro-Russian forces, but they were always marginal forces and they were always a part of the marginal discourse. Pro-Russian discourse has never been the uh, mainstream uh, discourse in Georgian politics. What we see right now is that the pro-Russian discourse has entered the Georgian uh, mainstream. And uh, even worse, the uh, Georgian administration, current Georgian government is not only sitting on the fences uh, by playing the neutral uh, card and sort of somewhere in between, uh, but proactively uh, promotes uh, pro-Russian uh, narrative uh, domestically. I mean, uh, we see how the uh, government affiliated uh, forces, MPs, uh, uh, groups are uh, supporting the, uh, uh, and here I see that Linus is joining hey, us. Welcome Linus. That, turn on, turn on the, uh, the voice please. Now I hope it's it's working, yeah? Yes, it's working. Yeah. So how are sorry, you doing, sorry. Linus? Oh, surviving somehow. And how are you doing? <laughs> we all have to survive <laughs> these times. But I'm right. really very happy to see you. Very so happy so to I'll, see you. Okay. Alex, I'll, I'll wrap up my uh, discussions that again, uh, when we look to the Georgian the major change is that the pro-Russian discourse has entered the Georgian mainstream politics. And it's very depressing to to observe, we can we can build on, we can continue uh, discussing uh, this issue even in more detail. But meanwhile, again, I have not seen Minister Linkiewicz for a long time, and let me welcome uh, Linus. Uh, it's always a great pleasure uh, to see Minister Linkiewicz, and let me express my uh, sincere gratitude and appreciation for for his unwavering support. To Georgia, to Ukraine. I remember my old days in Brussels, in NATO, and uh, uh, Ambassador Linkiewicz was, was uh, not only a great supporter of Georgia's integration, but also probably one of the strongest advocates and champions of the idea of Europe whole, free, and, and peace, even at the times when this idea seemed to be less popular. So Linus, Ambassador Linkia, which has had always a very strong voice to support this uh, project. And I'm, I'm really uh, uh, glad to share those digital stage was with ambassadors. Let me, let me join yes. you first and foremost, uh, Magega, let me join you in uh, expressing gratitude in thanking uh, uh, Minister Linkavicius, Linus, thank you uh, uh, for being uh, 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 the, the strongest, one of the strongest, but in my view, the strongest supporter of Georgia. Uh, in uh, throughout the whole period of time, uh, we worked together or uh, on uh, NATO integration, on EU integration, uh, and um, uh, it, we always underlined that uh, we need. We need the friends. We need the friends like uh, Minister Linkavichus to achieve the goals. Uh, to achieve the goals uh, which are uh, of the existential importance. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope uh, you will continue uh, supporting Georgia uh, in these turbulent times uh, for Georgia uh, inside Georgia and. Uh, uh, and I believe that uh, uh, the developments in Ukraine uh, will bring us uh, to the new uh, uh, new global security architecture. Uh, uh, Giga has underlined uh, the the possibilities. Uh, we have discussed the. Uh, uh, I don't want to get you into this uh, fortune telling uh, game, you know, about uh, the the how and when. Uh, exactly uh, will end the war in Ukraine, but uh, uh, in my belief, uh, it's going to end uh, with the victory of uh, of Ukraine, brave Ukrainian people. Uh, uh, President Zelensky uh, uh, has mentioned that the Letterman show that uh, when Putin dies, uh, the war ends. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, General Ben Hodges. Uh, has uh, projected that uh, after February, uh, 
there will be a significant uh, offensive operation starting uh, in uh, by Ukraine armed forces, ending with the uh, liberating of Crimea by the end of August. In August, so there are there are a number of projections. How do you see? How do you view? Uh, we are none of us uh, that the military experts. Though you were the uh, twice the Minister of National Defense, and you were better uh, have better understanding what's happening right there on the ground. But we're more than happy to hear uh, from you uh, how you see the developments in uh, in this war against Russia's aggression. And thank you once again for joining us. I also thank you very much and thank you for these nice words and we are really friends for a long time and as you said friends of Georgia that means uh, not friends of some particular political party or political wing but definitely of the country which uh, really experiencing very difficult time I would say. Now we're talking about Ukraine and you're quite right uh, many things depend on developments in, in Ukraine or around Ukraine and uh, including including uh, fate of Georgia I would say but uh, you're quite right a lot of predictions a lot of forecasts some are purely optimistic i also would like to see that happening that by next spring they will clean the territory of ukraine for for russia that would be nice uh, but uh, I, I don't know whether it's realistic on the other hand uh, some are saying that it's already decided that ukraine will be uh, accepted to nato it's already decided i hear a lot of voices of many experts I don't know where they are getting it from. Uh, and again, this is uh, what I'd like to say. This is really a possibility and we shouldn't miss this possibility and to, to do our best uh, in the, uh, in, in the forthcoming, forthcoming, so to say, future. But it's not a done deal by far. When we are uh, claiming to each other and, and trying to convince that Ukraine must win, Ukraine must win, we all agree. But at the same time, we not, not we, but some of us, they cannot realize that Russia must lose. And for some, it's too difficult to, to perceive, you know. Uh, if, if to lose, for some, it's again difficult to perceive that too badly. But that means maybe uncontrolled collapse. Uh, that's, that's for some uh, looks like, like a disaster, you know. Uh, and uh, splitting the country, uh, uncontrolled nuclear weapons, uh, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, we have to understand that Ukrainians are not waiting. They, they, they should defend their country, and we must support every day, and the support should be increasing. And again, answering to your question, when, it depends on many ifs. If we will not uh, get tired, if uh, this fatigue will not come on, come on so to say, uh, will not take over uh, of this of this enth enthusiasm and and quite meaningful uh, actions which are now uh, produced by European Union, by NATO, by United States, by United Kingdom, by Poland, uh, by some other countries. If this will continue, and I would, would say not only in the uh, context of delivering of, of weapons, uh, this is quite meaningful. The so-called Rammstein coalition, up to fifty countries. Every, every month, so to say, measuring uh, possibilities, uh, although some storages are already emptied. But nevertheless, 50 countries, it's impressive. So uh, I cannot uh, understand how it could, could be, so to say, exhausted in the future. So we have just to plan to continue. But the same Rammstein coalitions needed in, 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 this, in the area of economy, in the area of reconstruction, and now we are talking about when wind is uh, already here, not approaching, but it's already here uh, in the in the area of energy, uh, because it's very also a difficult time. So if all these coalitions will be in place, if we will have this uh, sustainable support, financial, economic, political, military, uh, then really by, by next spring uh, could be some changes. That's right. But if something will be stuck, if some, some ideas will come up, like I, as I said, uh, not to allow Russia to lose too badly, uh, or again, these uh, self-inflicted red lines, what I concerned very much. I cannot understand some, sometimes you mentioned I was defense minister, really. I, probably, I don't understand what means defensive weapons, you know, in the, in the war. And uh, when some politicians are making statements that weapons should be delivered only defensive, exceptionally defensive, in order not to allow Ukraine to attack Russian territory, I, I can understand, but what means Russian territory? If launch site of missiles are on Russian uh, territory, uh, close to the border, not necessarily in Moscow, but let's say Belgorod, other places, so are they not the legitimate, legitimate targets? I, I doubt. 
Uh, if, if you know, a few months ago, somebody would ask, is Crimea is, is a legitimate target? Uh, some, uh, some probably will hesitate to answer clearly. Now, <coughs> this red line deleted by Georgians, uh, by, by Ukrainians themselves. They, they mentioned, they, they made that real. But self-inflicted uh, red lines still exist and, uh, and uh, uh, long range artillery, hard artillery badly needed uh, for Ukrainians, although they received a lot, although, although they received really unprecedented <coughs> this weapon system hel helping them make a difference on the battlefield, but they need more. And uh, if that will continue again, I would come back to predictions that then I agree with General Hodges, with whom we are discussing quite quite often all these issues. Yeah, by spring that could could happen. So we have to be consistent. Instead of concerning about uh, how how deep and how badly and what, what, whatever, we have to do what we didn't do <coughs> for ma for many years. And you probably know I am always mentioning uh, Georgia because it was first unlearned lesson for, for Western community, for, for, for NATO, for European Union, for everyone. And this uh, occupation of 20% of Georgian territory was probably a factor which was really decisive at that time. It was really decisive, uh, unpunished, uh, and, uh, and uh, that was beginning of, this, of all this disaster, basically. And then next stop was Crimea and so on and so forth. But the beginning was 2008 and also this fatal uh, NATO meeting in Bucharest where I was present myself and I remember quite well all these discussions and we were really in complete minority trying to convince that we have to give membership action plan to Georgia and Ukraine. It was complete, complete minority, it was no, no, no way to do that. And our arguments that that would be a green light for Russia to take care in this backyard as they consider all these countries. And so we were not able to convince and uh, war started very, very soon as, as we all know, and all this process started. So when, when, when aggressor uh, find, found that price is agreeable, that they can do that and, uh, and, and the reaction will be really not terribly bad for them. It's not my assessment, it's assessment of themselves. If we would follow they are, so to say, TV programs and this number of these shows where they were laughing at the sanctions, laughing at the reaction, saying, so we did that, so what, and what happened? So why we shouldn't continue? Now it's different, now it's different, but even now, I would not, I was, uh, soon I will stop because my maybe intervention too long, but even now when we're saying that our sanctions are unprecedented, we still, still understand that main sources of uh, we're f feeding this war machine in Russia are not closed and gas and oil still, still, so to say, used and with some caveats, with some exceptions. And after 10 months of war, uh, we have this nine sanctions package, which really number is quite impressive. But again, we still see is uh, some potential to improve and make it better. So a uh, long answer to your short question. And I would really wish that would uh, happen faster, uh, sooner than later. But again, it depends on political will and it depends on our perception that what is happening, it's re re really, really offensive, uh, not only against Ukraine, but also against Western society, but, uh, against our institutions, our, our organizations. Otherwise, everything will collapse, there, frankly, because the uh, international community already proved that not sufficient and not uh, efficient enough uh, to withstand aggression, as, as this, is, this, this, this is happening now. And uh, we really should draw uh, very serious uh, conclusions out of that. Um, thank you, Linus. Uh, thank you very much. As always, not surprisingly, very frank, very direct and open um, uh, answers uh, about, to the questions which I have raised. Uh, and we have uh, discussed this many times, but uh, I have now the three blocks of the questions. First is about, and um, uh, I want you to ask about the uh, uh, weapons delivery. Uh, the Minister Kuleba of uh, Ukraine, Foreign Minister, has very rightly mentioned that uh, he does, uh, doesn't really understand uh, why um, it's uh, okay to provide the artillery and the, the rocket systems uh, and not providing the tanks. Uh, they are in negotiations with the German side and I hope very much they will get finally the 
the, the tanks. Um, uh, Russian propagandists do not believe that uh, the, the, uh, the warehouses are, uh, and the reserves are exhausted in NATO. They are saying that, uh, in contrary, it's just a very minor uh, portion has been delivered uh, to Ukraine. So uh, where is the answer to this question? Because I am in always in the debates, debates here in Georgia. But the question is, which I hardly can answer, why the pace uh, is still slow uh, to uh, providing the, the weaponry. Of course, without uh, the Western support, without what the United States has provided, Lithuania, uh, United Kingdom, Germany, France, all other European countries have provided. Uh, there would be no um, uh, resilience and victories uh, we have seen uh, at the front uh, front lines. But uh, is this about this uh, um, uh, the, the frog uh, frog uh, metaphor? You know, the, the boiling the frog. Uh, uh, so uh, what I mean is that. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, getting this uh, this space along with the sanctions which you have mentioned to to work effectively efficiently those sanctions and in parallel to that to provide the the weaponry uh, which could reach uh, the, the 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 deeper inside uh, the Russian territory because we have seen that uh, in uh, Ryazan and in this uh, the other region the Engels. Um, strategic airfield has been bombed by the, the, the I, I, I'm sure that it was the kamikaze drones uh, uh, used by the Ukrainians. So uh, it, it is already a fact. So uh, why don't deliver the Atacams? Why don't deliver? I was happy to see that Slovakian foreign minister has raised the issue of discussing this uh, MIG-29 uh, fighter jets to be provided finally to, to Ukraine and to agree on this. So uh, where is where is the key to this uh, decision? And where is the obstacle to this decision? Uh, this obstacle is self-inflicted red lines. And that started from the very beginning. I would say there were some mistakes made at the very beginning. And I would uh, really would repeat that uh, when uh, this uh, special terrorist operation, operation started 24th of uh, February, Almost every day there were statements by European leaders, but NATO leaders that NATO will not engage, you remember. NATO is not going to involve, not going to engage. I don't know, the, maybe it was designed to, 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 to calm down Russia, I don't know, whatever, but it happened to the contrary. Contrary, it happened that you do what, whatever you want and we will not engage. So that was wrong, that was a mistake. Now, now later, it was some noise about jets, you remember? planes and suddenly it collapsed everything. And again, self-inflicted, uh, so to say, red line, which was not uh, launched by Russia, but Russians also listening, listening to these debates and why they shouldn't uh, confirm that some, some Western uh, countries are concerned about delivery of, 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 of uh, planes and that would be considered as crossing red line. Of course, they, uh, they happily agree and they use this in their propaganda and in their, their language uh, but not, not, not there started that. It started by, 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 by NATO. And say, same now. Uh, I also cannot understand uh, why, why uh, artillery can be delivered, uh, missiles can be delivered, and, and drones can be delivered, which they really can reach territory deep into the, into the Russian, which is already the case, but by, by the way, as we can see. But why they cannot deliver tanks? Maybe, again, it has to do with the, if it's Soviet production, so uh, storage is really uh, are exhausted. But there should be, again, another stage to, to provide uh, Western tanks, for instance. That's for some, again, another red line, maybe for the beginning, or, or some other sensitivities. I don't know. So it's moving too slow. I hope it will be faster. I hope the, there will be understanding that time is also important. And, uh, and also very important, uh, it's, uh, you shouldn't be expert to understand, but in this situation, any pause, any, any possibility to regain power, so to say, it's used uh, for Russia, not for peace, of course, but definitely to, to come back to the war after some situation, which, which they definitely, they desperately uh, need, need some pause, some strategic pause and some, some break 
uh, and uh, they're calling that as uh, negotiations, whatever, but this is really has nothing to do with peace. It also should be understood. But for some colleagues in Western countries still looks like, uh, yeah, they are looking for peace, so let's, let's make it happen because everybody's tired and fatigue of all that disaster. And this is again, uh, self, so to say, uh, kind of really uh, very, 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 very tricky situation, and should should be should be read uh, in in the real, real terms, not in wishful thinking, not guided by wishful thinking. So uh, let's not allow them to to have this gap and this this break, and and this is re really important. And negotiations, I also agree, but now the base for negotiations and. Uh, the reasons and arguments will be created on the battlefield. Everybody also understands. And that's uh, quite clear since very beginning. If we would talk in March, right? If we were talking in, in May, that would be a different, different situation. And now, now it's a, again, completely different situation. And I, I can agree with, with Zelensky and others who are saying we shouldn't do that. Why, why we should do that? Of course not. And uh, that's important to, to, for, for the Western countries also to realize. I hope it's happening. There were some hints, there were some even efforts to, to, to I shouldn't say press for, 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 for negotiations, but to, to, to advise, yeah? but now it's not going uh, to happen. And everybody said that it should be done and all these negotiations should, if they will happen, they should be on the terms of uh, defined by, by Ukraine. And, and I hope this is really, really uh, consensus understanding. So this is, this is very important to understand. Otherwise, uh, by the way, when it was said, and you probably mentioned that the war will end when Putin will be dead, when Zelensky. Putin is well, well, Putin is Putin is will be dead because, uh, you know, Putin will be replaced. Uh, who knows? Uh, maybe that would happen. Uh, we shouldn't think that other personality will be better. You know, and these forces which will uh, take over will be democratic or whatever. I, I doubt that would happen. But maybe they will be more realistic. Maybe they will understand that the uh, situation went too far uh, and uh, it's really leading country to the abyss, basically. And uh, they should really change. They will not change thinking. Unfortunately, they will not change ambitions, but they will change behavior if, if this defeat will be painful. <coughs> if they will have, if they will get no, no pain, painful defeat, uh, if, if they uh, will really plan in, into the future to have contacts uh, international relations as it was before. What I'm afraid, it's also the reason. There are some colleagues, unfortunately, in the Western countries ready to, to talk with Putin after everything will be over, you know? Uh, unfortunately or whatever, but this is true. And they're still calculating that, you know, it's reality, so we should take reality as it is. And, and that's, that's the most important thing. But on the other hand, we cannot, cannot so to say, understand how it could happen after all what was done by that country, by Putin, by the regime. So a lot of, a lot of uh, <clears throat> strange, strange things happening, but not first time in the history, you know. Yeah, we always, it's, uh, yeah, it's, we shouldn't be too, too much, we shouldn't be surprised too much, but we have to assess situation uh, in, in the frank and open way and, uh, and really to, to, to come up with the principled and concrete arguments, not to, to, si not to silence uh, those who are trying to expose uh, what is most important. And this is uh, diplomacy, it's, it's fine, but uh, diplomacy not backed by re real concrete tangible arguments on the ground means nothing, especially when you have business with, with such a partner li like, like Russia. Yeah, all, all three of us, yes, I, I see you want to add, all three of us are a long time in the diplomacy in this business. Well, we are supposed to be happy when and optimistic when we hear about the possibility of negotiations. But um, I am personally getting nervous when I hear about the the, uh, the the need to put around the table with Putin, who is the, the really the, the terrorist number one in this world, and now uh, executing the terrorist operation, as you very rightly mentioned. Uh, Giga, uh, uh, what do you think uh, I, I see you wanted to add about this uh, negotiations issue. And, no, I, uh, I, I totally please. agree with uh, uh, Minister Linkiewicz is very eloquently uh, uh, listed the reasons what uh, made Russia and Putin emboldened, uh, including the 2008 aggression against Georgia that was followed by the reset, 
and the, all other events uh, where Russia got a very pale uh, response. And even the most recently, before the start of the conflict, the NATO Secretary General or some NATO member countries were largely explaining what NATO is not, uh, won't do, is not going to do, instead what NATO will do to support uh, Ukraine. So all those I wholly agree on this assessment that this was uh, counterproductive. Uh, I would, uh, on the other side, I would argue that what Russians are doing right now, Russians are uh, proceeding on three different fronts. The first is that they are trying to break the uh, will of the Ukrainian people to uh, resist by this barbaric uh, uh, this barbaric uh, bombing uh, campaign against the critical uh, infrastructure. But I think that this is not going to work and it will be counterproductive. I don't think that uh, destroying the uh, Ukrainian infrastructure, uh, 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 taking out the uh, or, uh, electricity, uh, electrical uh, stations is going to work or is going to break the Ukrainian resilience. The second direction was the uh, nuclear gambit that Putin started and uh, the nuclear uh, blackmailing. And I would argue that what we have seen recently is again the uh, toning down on uh, nuclear uh, blackmailing. Why? Because of the three reasons, I would argue. First, it didn't impact the uh, Ukrainian stance at all. Uh, second, I would argue that uh, Russians got a, a very direct and, uh, 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 and unequivocal uh, warning from United States and from uh, Western, other Western powers, but most importantly, from United States. But most importantly, it was also reaction from China and India. And eventually Russians realized that this kind of a nuclear gambit may cost them the uh, support of the uh, global South. So this was important. So we have seen the backing down from that perspective. Now the third and the most important is what uh, Minister Linkiewicz is discussed. This is a self-inflicted red lines. And this is this notion that uh, we should not corner Russia. We should not. Uh, we should give some kind of a face saving uh, to Russian leadership. Uh, otherwise, the conflict will escalate and will spill over over Europe or over uh, NATO. I think that this is the wrong assumption. Uh, and only uh, only uh, antidote to this wrong assumption uh, is the uh, Ukrainian uh, resilience and Ukrainian actions on the battlefield. And. Uh, Whenever we see this kind of hesitation or self-inflicted uh, red lines from the Western side, then we see this uh, Ukrainian actions on the battlefield that changes this equation, that the changes this uh, dynamics of the discussion. Again, uh, there was this whole discussion that the Ukraine will fall in 24 to 32 hours, but Ukrainians uh, changes this course. Then there was a discussion that uh, uh, after the Kiev, probably this is this is where probably the lines of occupation uh, will be. But again, Kharkiv and later Kherson against again changes discussion. I hope that again, uh, or Ukrainians themselves uh, and Ukrainian military and Ukrainian political uh, leadership will not allow not all but certain Western leaders to inflict the uh, red lines on uh, themselves. Uh, and to draw the false conclusions that by providing face saving to uh, Putin, they will eventually avoid the escalation of the conflict because it will be actually contrary. By providing face savings, they will provide the breathing space to Russian leadership that would eventually escalate the conflict, not only in Ukraine, but in other parts of Europe as well. Uh, thank you, thank you, Giga. I uh, forgot to uh, to mention what the house ordered that uh, uh, the the uh, you, the attendees could uh, put the questions. And here we have the uh, my colleague and friend Nino Gelashvili. She is a journalist from Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty's Georgian service, asking uh, Minister Linkevichos. Uh, could you please tell us if there are clear benchmarks defined by the Western allies for assessing the sanctions effectiveness? In particular, how soon is it envisaged that sanctions steps against Russian 
energy resources have impact on Putin's war machine so that he will have to stop it. It will be of great importance for the post-war period too. As naturally, it's a very good question. Uh, we all know that uh, you rightly mentioned that they are still receiving the, the benefits uh, and uh, petrodollars and uh, the, the natural gas dollars and uh, 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 funding and financing the, the, the uh, daily war activities. So uh, what is the real uh, benchmarks? Are there any real ben benchmarks for assessing the, the sanction effectiveness? Main, cha main challenge and task to make them suffer, you know, to make them painful consequences of what they are doing. And that was always since the outset, it was it was really designed, but that's really very difficult happening. And as I said, uh, gas and oil, you know, even even to mention that per, per, per day, they, they're getting one billion, right? Uh, from from yes from 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 Europe European Union, so comparing with other products and goods, it's nothing even by far nothing to compare. Gas uh, gas is postponed for the later stages because of technical reasons. We all know, right? Uh, oil uh, started to be implemented, but again a lot of caveats. We are talking only about shipments, right? We are not only talking about uh, pipes uh, pipelines. Uh, which is which is also very important and this 60 60 uh, uh, price cap also not terribly terribly uh, impressive uh, so and but by the way russians also installed so-called shadow fleet uh, to yes. to avoid all these sanctions so uh, i'm not saying that it's not working because it's already happening but very slowly but again experts saying it's have again it takes uh, takes time and uh, it was said since very beginning the same sanctions will be felt later stages it's not immediately not next month not even uh, so to say uh, in half a year but uh, spring next spring again spring becoming decisive period for war situation for for change in the battlefield uh, for for other 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 reasons including sanctions it's already getting getting uh, more and more uh, kind of efficient, and I, I hope uh, that this this winter, as we're saying, is decisive for Ukraine for survivability, for, for whatever, for for Europe to, to also withstand all this uh, energy energy so to say crisis. But uh, we have really to pass this test because after that, really, spring could be decisive in in, in solution of this of this problem altogether. Uh, militarily, politically, and also in terms of sanctions. So this is becoming a big, big problem uh, for Russia. And uh, well, benchmarks are, as I said, to make it painful to stop this war machine. So far, sanctions are not helping to stop war. By the way, some missiles, <coughs> it was mentioned by experts, were produced after sanctions were introduced in Russia. So that's uh, really quite illustrative showing the efficiency so whatever we are doing, they're still able to produce uh, produce weapons uh, themselves, and maybe not sophisticated, uh, not 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 really quite uh, quite uh, quite efficient weapons. What, what we really all know, but by massive massive number, this is uh, creating this creating big problems on the front line. We have to remember this is big country, by the way. Ukraine is a big country, but Russia is a terribly big country, and this uh, uh, potential is really uh, this mass, not not quality but quantity, also. <laughs> also makes a difference and potential to be exhausted also bigger you know takes time 10 months quite a lot but also not enough maybe to to make sure that this economy is starting to collapse and uh, but at the same time i still believe it's not visible not not clear publicly but the <clears throat> many of them already realized that what they did so far it was really by far not not according to the plan, as they say, right? This operation going exactly according to the plan, so it's happening not according to the plan by far. And it's uh, and this uh, first time in 10 years when Putin canceled this annual uh, conference, press conference, first time in 10 years, nothing to report. Uh, uh, instead of maybe he has a unique opportunity to tell how he managed in 10 years, in 10 months, to get country to this political, moral, military, uh, and uh, and uh, economical abyss. How how he managed to bring country to this to this situation, but maybe it was not very comfortable for him, so cancelled this this press conference. So a lot of signs, a lot of a lot of symptoms of situation is becoming more and more dangerous. But we should 
shouldn't so to say self be self complaining or whatever we have really to continue what we ought to do not to, to look what they are doing but to, to make sure that it's the right thing what we are doing i absolutely agree with you and there are also <coughs> some uh, uh, news that uh, uh, he is uh, hesitating to uh, to the schedule the time uh, for the address annual address to the uh, russian duma uh, the Russian parliament and uh, also uh, the, 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 the telegram channels, some of the telegram channels are um, spreading the, uh, the, the, the rumor that they canceled the annual uh, reception at the Kremlin. So, uh, but uh, the, it is confirmed, it is confirmed that uh, already that uh, he canceled this uh, first time in 10 years, as you rightly mentioned, his, uh, this big, uh, large uh, uh, press conference. So uh, you're right, he has uh, not very much to say, he has nothing to say. And uh, uh, by saying that uh, um, everything is going according to plan, uh, is getting uh, more, more and more ridiculous, even, even among, the, uh, among those mobilized and their family members who who know that uh, uh, their family members are fighting now right now uh, and uh, it was supposed to end and many many months ago <clears throat> so um, we may, we may, we talked about the, the nato enlargement so he uh, everything everything he uh, demanded from united states and nato uh putin he got uh, in, uh, absolutely in the contrary. I mean, uh, enlargement is there. Um, I hope very much, um, I'm, I'm sure that uh, Sweden and Finland uh, will join NATO in Vilnius, uh, the Vilnius summit. Um, I hope uh, uh, very much that uh, there will be new uh, secretary general elected at the Vilnius summit. Uh, but. Um, we were talking about the Bucharest summit uh, and the, the lessons learned. We all agree that uh, uh, it took a very, very long time and uh, the, the dramatically long time for Georgia, for Ukraine, and now for the civilized world to, to make the conclusions uh, that uh, it was a mistake not to granting uh, to Georgia and Ukraine the membership action plan then. Uh, now Ukraine is um, uh, the candidate uh, is asking, demanding for the speedy uh, uh, process of uh, speeding up the process of joining uh, NATO. What are the chances for Ukraine? The Secretary General uh, Stoltenberg mentioned that when Ukraine wins the war, uh, they will join. Uh, they will join NATO. Uh, what are the chances for Ukraine? Uh, uh, to uh, to uh, join NATO uh, sooner than someone uh, believed. And uh, again, we discussed this uh, to Georgians, but uh, before you joined us, uh, where is Georgia? Uh, what, what what are the chances for Georgia in this new uh, architecture, in this new wave of uh, possible enlargement? Because I hear more and more that uh, for Europeans, it is getting better to have the countries inside uh, than outside of NATO, for which uh, Russia is always making uh, uh, troubles with the entire world. So is this shifting in, uh, inside NATO that uh, it is better to have Ukraine and Georgia and even maybe sometime Moldova inside NATO to, to have more peace and stability in the future? Well, uh, talking about Moldova, probably you know it's in their constitution, they are neutral since yeah. 1994, and that uh, say, says by, by itself what that means. So they are really a very tricky, tricky situation, uh, no alliances, no protection, and if something could happen, uh, God knows how they would be protected, basically. So uh, it's, it's really understandable, and 100% dependence of gas, gas supply uh, electricity, everything, uh, as we can see, all these blackouts uh, after attacks on Ukraine, they're also suffering a lot. So very painful. On, on Ukraine and Georgia, again, you cannot uh, say that this is equal situation. Uh, 
And because of Ukraine, it's more visibility. But to tell that they will be immediately accepted to NATO, I would, I, I would wish that happened. But you know, I, I doubt this is so simple, simple as it is. Uh, what to make to make it faster, speedy? I can understand. And again, I may, may be told to you many times. I do not understand why this map is map is needed at all, and that should be skipped and should be fixed somehow. That is not necessary because all tools are here, uh, all, all leverages are in the possession. All mechanisms are in place, uh, and uh, special council uh, or commission, so to say, and uh, package of support, feedback mechanism, individual uh, programs are same structure as map, so no difference. Uh, everything is in place, so no no need to invent anything else, and just map should be skipped. And precedent will be Sweden and Finland. I hope uh, they are not uh, expected to. <clears throat> pass this uh, very important so to say stage which was obligatory for all candidates but now it looks like not not the case uh, with regard to sweden and finland so uh, that i would consider as a uh, faster than than normal but uh, while the war is not over to discuss membership uh, definitely it's not realistic and i hope everybody understands that and it's not not discussed in this in these terms until war is over after it will be over, uh, after Ukraine will win, I also among those who is convinced that they must must be uh, immediately accepted to, 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 to NATO, because just to prevent in the future something what would happen in, in this regard, and that's that's the case. Uh, on, on Georgia, it's another story, and you probably know, there is not so simple, not so easy on the EU track. There are some so to say, remarks, criticism, and expectations on EU track. And this is already this trio, already a bit split. I mean, Moldova, Ukraine, and Georgia. And Georgia is not excluded, but just put on waiting on waiting list with the conditions. And these conditions are serious, and they are important for NATO as well, I would say, not only for European Union. So uh, if we're now starting to discuss all these issues that would uh, unavoidably will come up all these issues as well, including problems, where we would be happy to help, as you rightly noticed. And I, I personally, when meeting officials in, in, in Belize and in opposition and position, I really said many, many times, guys, if you cannot talk to each other, let us engage and we can help maybe. Because you're wasting time. You are definitely destroying what was created. You are really destroying image, destroying in these efforts which were which were really so far very important. And when we were always saying that George is front runner, uh, although there were not too many running, <laughs> to, to be more precise, but nevertheless that was true. And now it's becoming like slipping away. So it's really really unfortunate. But again, everything nevertheless. But what we are talking, everything is depending now very much depending on, if not everything, but very much depending on outcome of this war in Ukraine, of course. Because if, if there will be prolong, 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 prolonged, so to say, conflict, and if it will not end, if the support will be exhausted, if political will will, will calm down, you know, a lot of fatigue among Europeans, a lot of problems in, inside, the Union as well, a lot of challenges already, as you know, in internal, so to say, tensions with some countries. So really this enthusiasm to make the speedy, speedy enlargement not always uh, here, and we should take it uh, as reality. So we sh should do our, our, our work, you know, that's very important. What I always was telling, looking at our example, telling to Georgians, for instance, guys, and I, I told you probably many times that I, as, as a, at that time, as well, I was ambassador, ambassador to, to 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 NATO, and was told many times by future allies that Lithuania will never be member of NATO. Never. You have promise. You have promise in NATO documents. So it's a huge difference. We had no promise. It was uh, just promise, not official. But that we will never be a member. So that was a big difference. But it didn't change our stance. Didn't change our position. We just did our best in with the leverages and instruments uh, we, we had in our possession and uh, that was and also was very important to create consensus among all political parties all spectrum from left to the bar to the right mm -hmm. they are not uh, they were never never uh, very friendly i have to tell you <laughs> on many issues they were 
major conflicts, you know. But on this uh, Euro Atlantic uh, platform, uh, it was com complete understanding and even complete ag agreement. And what I would like to convince Georgians to make, by the way, if it's really possibility, at least minor possibility, that would be very important signal outside because now. Unfortunately, we have just a headache coming from Georgia, unfortunately, sorry to, to mention that. It's really becoming quite you know, frustrating and we have to make difference here. So sorry for this blunt speech, but since you Always. asked me to be op open, open, so I'm trying to be open. I'm trying you to know, be open. You know from our relations <coughs> in the previous talks, I always preferred your blunt and uh, straightforward talk and uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate that very much. Uh, by the way, I always, uh, when I deliver lectures to the students, uh, by arguing what uh, was the conditions for Lithuania and other friends, I always quote you <laughs> by saying <laughs> that uh, uh, Lithuanians were told that we will never get you uh, inside NATO, but now they are NATO and EU members and how you progressed with your economy, stability and security. But, uh, 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 Gega, what do you think to follow up on uh, what... Uh, I, I, I agree with Linus first when it comes to Ukraine. Uh, I wish Ukraine could get uh, NATO membership sooner rather than later. I don't think that it's going to happen as long as there is an open conflict uh, going on. However, uh, uh, and it obviously depends on the outcomes of this uh, conflict. Even after this conflict is over, there I still think that there will be some voices uh, among certain NATO members that will be still opposing. However, I I think that I hope that those voices will be in in minority, unlike the Bucharest uh, summit. And I hope that once this conflict and war is over, Ukraine will uh, become a NATO member state. Because as we discussed before, uh, Ambassador uh, Minister Linkiewicz is joined. Uh, one of the important uh, criteria of joining uh, NATO is country's ability to contribute to Euro-Atlantic uh, uh, security. And I think that Ukrainians uh, are punching over their weight in contributing into European security architecture and into European uh, security. So I'm, to be frank, I'm more optimistic about Ukraine, although it's not going to happen. To jump in, do you also think that the, the precedent with the Sweden and Finland avoiding this uh, membership action plan, uh, ticking the uh, box? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, membership action. We have all the instruments. We have the action. We have all instruments. The uh, importance of the membership action plan has been overblown and politicized from the very beginning. So it doesn't have the pragmatic uh, or practical uh, dimension. And again, integration of Sweden and uh, Finland without this instrument just simply shows that uh, those instruments are not as practical as they are sometimes uh, uh, sold or projected uh, by some uh, member states. So that's uh, I, I agree on that with uh, with Linus uh, absolutely. Now. When it comes to uh, Georgia, we are, uh, and I have to admit, uh, uh, Lina, that we are even more depressed because uh, what is happening right now is, and sometimes domestically in Georgia, we have this uh, wrong assumption that the outcome of Ukrainian conflict is going to change domestic uh, dynamics. It's going to have an impact on domestic dynamics, but uh, it depends largely on uh, Georgian society, on Georgian political forces and on the uh, wisdom of the Jordan stakeholders. What we have seen so far, and it's really very unfortunate to see uh, Georgia not only sitting on the fences when it comes to this uh, conflict with Russia, but to actively promoting the pro-Russian narrative. Again, uh, we, are, we, are, we should not forget that we have a political class in our uh, administration right now who accuses uh, our uh, allies and friends from United States and European Union or NATO that European allies are trying to drag us into the conflict. That it's European allies and only reason why we didn't receive the uh, uh, candidate status was because we didn't engage in an open conflict. Uh, I would also uh, argue that this is the first time that we probably uh, crossed all red lines uh, domestically. There was a one red line that was probably uh, respected by all Georgian uh, stakeholders and politicians. This was never attacked. 
never criticize, never demonize the Georgian soldiers who are fighting in the battlefield. And what we have seen recently is demonization campaign against Georgian volunteers and Georgian soldiers who are fighting in Ukraine. And there was a speculations and the open implicit veiled threats that those Georgian soldiers that are fighting in Ukraine, uh, their citizenship will be revoked. That just to explain the degree or the extent what we have uh, reached uh, at this stage. And my final point is again that uh, we always had some uh, pro-Russian for voices uh, in our uh, political spectrum, but those voices were always marginal. They were never part of the political mainstream uh, in Georgian domestic uh, political scenery. And now uh, the pro-Russian narrative has become the mainstream. And that's a historical shift. And that's sometimes that even our closest friends are very much surprised and sometimes don't understand what really is happening. That's a historical shift that we are undergoing uh, right now. But uh, I, I still think, again, uh, I am hopeful that outcome of uh, uh, Russian-Ukrainian conflict will have a significant impact uh, on uh, domestic developments in Georgia. However, uh, uh, it largely depends on domestic stakeholders and not on uh, external uh, factors. I hope that we will uh, get external support. I hope that some of our friends and uh, allies won't put a blind eye uh, on those developments and will force those stakeholders to deviate from the Georgian mainstream political uh, uh, direction to pay certain price. Uh, but uh, it's again, it largely will depend uh, on, uh, on us, on, uh, on uh, Georgians to change this uh, direction. Before we uh, change uh, uh, domestic uh, political uh, dynamics, I don't think that uh, we have any perspective right now uh, uh, on our way to European or Euro-Atlantic integration because the country that has a political prisoners, country uh, that, uh, uh, I don't know, the per persecutes the, uh, or harasses the uh, media outlets and owners of the uh, opposition media or free media uh, owners on a, a constant uh, basis, the uh, countries that uh, undermine the all independent power poles, whether those are the NGOs or the, uh, or the media or political opposition political parties. I don't think that uh, at this stage we have any, any chances of a, a meaningful uh, progress. On a positive side, however, I, I and that's I still want to end on a positive side is that uh, Georgian society and all polls uh, have shown so far that overwhelming majority of the Georgian people, overwhelming majority of the Georgian society, uh, are uh, staunchly pro-Western. Uh, when we look to the all polls, over eighty or five percent support the EU integration, close to 80% support the uh, NATO uh, integration. So uh, uh, that's why I, I hope that all this backsliding and deviation from the historical pattern uh, is a, a historical short-term anomaly in our political life, and we will be able to correct it as soon as possible. I hope very much too. Um, um, uh, let's uh, let's be optimistic. Uh, next time we meet, there will be much bigger progress in uh, uh, in Ukraine, uh, and all the projections of uh, uh, Ukraine's uh, success will be will become the uh, the reality. And I hope very much that uh, we will not be uh, too uh, far away uh, behind the, uh, in this. Uh, uh, frankly, competition uh, on the, the EU integration. I want to congratulate Bosnia and Herzegovina by uh, getting the candidate status, at, but at the same time, really, uh, uh, we just left a uh, few of us, a couple of uh, countries uh, like uh, Georgia, and I think uh, Kosovo is planning to uh, officially apply for the uh, EU membership now. And um, uh, the gap is increasing. 
the gap uh, uh, is increasing between Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine, and uh, and Georgia. And uh, well, if I agree with with Gega that we if we don't solve the problems uh, inside the country. Uh, with the problems you all have mentioned and you will both know very well, there will be no progress on uh, on EU and uh, uh, NATO integration. But uh, let's be optimistic, let's be hopeful that um, things will change, the external support uh, will continue, will increase, and uh, the things uh, will change dramatically on the battlefield uh, in favor of uh, brave Ukrainian people and the Georgian soldiers. Um, I, we were always proud, uh, Gega, you know uh, better than myself, of course, but we were always proud when Georgians participated in the, the international security operations. Uh, it's well been uh, absolutely um, appreciated by the top uh, level militaries and the politicians, the leaders of the country saying that your militaries are already in NATO. I am being battle tested uh, allies of, of NATO members. And so these uh, same soldiers are fighting for the uh, future of uh, not only Ukraine and not only Georgia, uh, but the European and Euro-Atlantic space. And uh, I'm sure that uh, their fight, their sacrifice will be uh, will be praised uh, with uh, uh, future results for uh, for Georgia. So thank you very much, uh, dear colleagues, dear friends. I wish you all the best. I wish you uh, Merry Christmas, uh, Happy New Year. So I, I doubt we will meet before that, uh, but uh, I hope very much that uh, you will. Uh, we all will have uh, to celebrate next year many good things coming from Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. Alex. Thank, you, so thank much. you. Best best wishes to all of your friends. Also, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.